Okay, so um, this is going to be less on the technical side, uh, though if anyone wants to cover some of the technical stuff, please hit me up afterwards. I'm more than happy to jump in. Uh, and what we're going to cover is how to engage. So a your infosec team as, a, as an engineer, as a developer, how do we really engage them and help move the organization towards a, towards a zero trust environment? And the reason why I'm focusing on you as engineers is that I think the source of, of a zero trust strategy has to have a very strong component of application developers being part of that. Like, it's not something that you can just say, oh, I'm gonna go buy a product, we're zero trust now, or we're gonna create some definitions in InfoSec and configure some firewall rules and now we're zero trust. So this is something that really requires a fundamental shift in some of the controls that exist uh, within the application or that the application itself is designed so that it can make use of some of those, some of those controls. And in order to properly engage with InfoSec, it also helps to understand who they are, where they come from, why, do, why they do the things that they do, uh, they're, uh, we, we don't want to treat them as like, here is a brick wall, we have to scale, but instead as uh, valuable partners that help us get to where we want to go. So um, a very brief intro, uh, whenever you talk with someone who's in security or, or infosec, you will often see this triangle, uh, it's the CIA triad, which covers confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so what they mean by by these three things is that you can take pretty much any security control and try to map it to, to one or more of these. Um, interestingly, availability is often ignored. People often focus on the confidentiality and integrity, but the fact that your system has to stay online, that it has to meet its SLAs, is, uh, of, is a critical component of that availability as well. So if you look at what InfoSec is really trying to do, they're not trying to tell you no. What they're trying to do is trying to identify what risks are there. They're trying to work out how to inform you of, of what the risks are, inform the executive leadership. Executive leadership has to then take those risks and then make a determination based upon what, uh, what the outcomes are going to be and what those risks are as to whether they're going to accept the risk or if they're not gonna accept the risk, then what can they do to mitigate the risk uh, mitigate as in like we're going to stick a firewall in front of it or we're going to stick a policy engine in front of it or how do you transfer the risk. Uh, tra transferring the risk I'm, uh, is an important aspect but that's something we won't, that is probably not our first line of defense that we want to head towards. Uh, a really good example of transfer of risk that we're seeing today though is you're, you're seeing cyber security insurance so if someone gets ransomware then they can say hey we're going to bring in this particular thing to help with that. Uh, but Generally, that's like worst case scenario. And another example of that from a personal perspective is like if you're driving a car, uh, you can transfer some of the financial liability to an insurance company. So transfer of risk. Uh, final one is avoidance, which is like, you know what? This is too dangerous or we don't want to accept the risk. Value is not there. So you just eliminate the, uh, the thing that was bringing in the risk in the first place. So it'd be like, let's go and remove the data and go purge it or destroy the medium or so on. And then now it's not a risk. Uh, and so they also like to establish uh, policy standards, procedures, and guidelines. What we mean by this is policy is I, all data at rest must be encrypted. Proce uh, uh, standards would be, we use AES. Uh, procedures would be something like we use BitLocker in this specific way to implement AES to have that encryption. And then guidelines are things that are good advice to follow, but you don't necessarily have to follow them. But there may be implications if you do, but it's not like strictly required. So uh, in terms of the other thing that you often see as well is response to security incidents and, and breaches. Uh, so as in like something happens, there are the teams who, they have teams there who go and do the forensics and so on. Um, one word of advice though as well since is if you try to avoid the word breach and the reason you want to avoid this word, this specific word is because there's only a small number of people in the, in any organization who is able to say that something is a breach because there are serious legal ramifications that come with that word. 
So always start with the word incident. Avoid the word breach until someone from the pro from the appropriate group has said this is a this is a breach, and then from that moment on, you would then use that that particular term. But whenever you engage with them or you're engaging with a colleague, like always use the word like we've had an incident. You know, I think this is serious or so on. You can, you can say like what's 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 happening, but uh, but stay away from that specific word because there are serious legal implications. So just as a heads up. Um, and so, but all of this comes down to two things, due care and, and due diligence. And due care is like, you're doing the right thing. Due diligence is how can we show that we've done the right thing or what are the actions we're doing to ensure we're doing those things. So the, every major InfoSec group has to show that they're following due care and that they're following due diligence. Uh, an easy heuristic to this is, what would a person who is trained in this, who is an expert in this, do what, what would a reasonable set of actions be if you if you can consider those to be reasonable then you're probably following due care um, and this also becomes very important because when you start looking at massive organizations this due care if you're not following due care then there may be major implications that go to the actual person themselves who is supposed to have that due care so um, so let's jump a little bit forward now. So we've gone over some of the basics for, for InfoSec. It describes like how they think, like why, why they do the things that they do. Um, one of the things that we're moving away from is this concept of perimeter defense. So this is like your standard network that you tend to see. There's so many variations of this. One of the variations is uh, Kubernetes is actually uh, historically uh, started off as a perimeter defense style approach. You have your pod network. Pods can talk to pods, pods can talk to nodes, nodes can talk to nodes. So very, very perimeter defense-like. You had ingress controllers and so on, and eventually you started to put more policy, which helped drive it down. But uh, like this, this is a pattern that you see over and over and over again. Where we want to move is towards this nebulous thing called zero trust, where you have controls that are more granular, closer to the workloads, you have this untrusted network uh, that you're no longer basing your your system on. And you have this attacker that's on the far end. So if they get in, just because they're on the network does not mean that they have access to the rest of the system. So in a nutshell, this is sort of the view that we want to, to approach for hitting that, that zero trust approach. Um, but interestingly, if you go to a company and you say, we need zero trust, one of the problems that we're running into is that every vendor has a different set of, of what zero trust is. That we actually we actually have a lot of, of issues on, on this particular path as a whole industry because the term is diluted, it's, it's been hyped up, it's everyone selling you a zero trust thing. Things that were invented 15 years ago are being pitched as zero trust. Um, it's like, it's, it's really hard to make sense of it. So, the very first thing that you need to do if you're migrating a, a company of, of sufficient size is you actually have to define for yourself, well, when we say zero trust, this is what we mean. So you need a framework. So one framework that I've been working with some colleagues on is this concept of, like the same way we have the CIA triad, we have this concept of zero trust where we have identity, policy, and control. And when you establish this, this actually gives you something like we're bringing in a product. Where does it fit? Does it give us identity? Does it make our identity story better? Does it allow us to manage a scale? Or is it a policy thing? Like, are we able to, to drive and control things and uh, create rules around it in order to control it? Is from the control side, is this something that's automatable? Is it observable? Is it something that I can, uh, that I can manage at scale? So we have, so we have this framework and diving a little bit into it a little bit further. So we have identity. And when we say identity, the area that I have been trying to push companies towards is this concept of cryptographic identity. So if you think about how your identity is done today in a lot of organizations, it's actually IP address and port. You're, all your firewall rules, like you start looking at them, they're like I, IP address and port. You, maybe DNS helps break this a little bit, but it still ends up boiling down to IP address and port. So if we can land a cryptographic identity, uh, one of the ones that I'm involved with is Spiffy. So uh, if you like, I hope that it ends up being something like Spiffy, but it doesn't have to be Spiffy. The, the fundamental thing is the, is the principle. You get a cryptographic identity, then you have something there that you can, that you can control. 
that uh, it's ephemeral, so that identity eventually goes away after some period of time. Uh, so ideally, you want to keep those short. In Spiffy's case, the expiration time is an hour. So you actually issue an X509 certificate. Instead of it lasting for a year, you, you have to renew it in 30 minutes to an hour, um, which gives us the ability to constantly validate the workloads. So in other words, we can check, does this thing still meet our requirements based upon what patch set it is? Is it running the software that it should? Is it configured in the way that we want it configured? Is it attached to a system that has the right set of TPMs? Uh, maybe it's gone out of compliance, and then you can not you don't necessarily have to kill it, but you could you could look at the workload and say, well, let's go ahead and flag it, and let's make sure that 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 uh, we're able to properly audit and get the right people who own that in order to go pat patch the system or or go fix it. We that also gives us the ability to have systems communicate with each other using something like mutual TLS, where you can think of mutual TLS like you, in the same way like when you go to like google.com or your bank.com, you're able to validate the server as the client. Mutual TLS allows you as a workload to do the opposite. As the server, I can validate the client, the, I can validate the identity right off of the transport. So this means I don't even have to bring secrets. I don't have to have bearer tokens or JOTs. We want to make that initial connection out to the system that uh, in both directions, they can validate each other. So the X509 certificate becomes part of that chain of who you are and allows you to identify yourself to others in a, in a uniform way. You also have to pay attention to user identity. Uh, I'm not diving into user identity in this scenario, but it's also very important that you consider what are your user identities doing. Generally, we want to stick with standards, something like JOTS or, or similar. Uh, that'll play well into, into policy. So then you want to establish something around policy, and generally you want to have policy consume your identity. So the, with, with policy, if you, if you make them declarative, so there's a few uh, engines that exist in CNCF, but there's others as well throughout the entire community. So if, if, you, if you're able to say, I want this family of certificates or identities that are cryptographically secure, and you're able to add that into your policy, so you can say, the front end server of this application is able to connect to the back end server or back end database of this particular system, you can model that, which means that if something else is trying to connect to those systems, it violates your policy, and that gets you fast feedback on your observability platform that something went wrong. This is actually key because if you look at many previous attacks, they managed to break in through the front door through Jakarta struts uh, on an unpatched system or, uh, or some other similar technology. And then once they manage to, get to capture that system, and then uh, they end up extracting out information from, from the perimeter. But if you have this policy in place that says system A is allowed to talk to system B and is allowed to send these type of messages because it is that, it, it's playing that role, then this scopes down the types of attacks and the attacker does not necessarily know what policy you are running on the other side or what are valid messages you can send. So this actually ends up increasing the risk to the attacker and simultaneously reduces the value to the attacker. That's really important. Whenever you look at a security control, you always want to consider how does this increase the risk to the attacker and how does it decrease the value to the attacker? Like that, it is like pure economics to them. And this, this also plays all the way up to advanced persistent threats because even APTs, they, even they have limited resources. They still have to make decisions on where they're going to attack. And if you look like you're well defended and you're not gonna get much value out of it, they'll actually go find softer targets. Um, in terms, so we also wanna have policies over time. We, we wanna make them human readable so people can audit them and, and create them. And we want them to be machine readable so that the machine can, can implement them. Uh, a really good heuristic is you look at how GitOps works. Imagine having a GitOps system that allows you to control and, and manage your policy through that. So you have a place you can commit your, your code, your, your policy. You're able to get that policy uh, reviewed. Uh, they goes to the right stakeholders in the same way like you would with a code PR. You know, it's like, oh, I have something checked into something that touches the database. So I'll get the database admins to look at it. I have something that is going to touch this particular area. So let's make sure that I bring in the right set of owners for, for that. Uh, from the various groups, and um, and that gives us a path towards uh, also maintaining that policy over time. It becomes something that is visible to the people who needs to. Um, and those we can actually tie that that identity, as I mentioned, 
to the mutual TLS transport credentials. So we actually look at the transport credentials. You're not saying I am this. You're relying on your cryptographic certificate to prove who you are. Uh, then control, all of this doesn't matter if you have no way to control it. So this is where you want to start looking at things like how do I, how do I build automation around it? How do I add observability to it? Um, how do I control this? Like if you're controlling a single cluster, you can install things like Istio, Linkerd, you'll, you'll be in good shape. If you want to control a large number of clusters, many of them ran by different teams and start to get a more uniform approach, then we really need to start thinking a lot bigger about how these interactions occur. So it's more like an intra versus inter uh, approach. Uh, there's also issues around how do you, how do you log, where, where do you keep your metrics, uh, ensure that you do your SLA. So all of these are, are important. If you don't have good control over your system, you're, you're not going to achieve your, your goals. So again, framework, identity, policy, and control. So now that we have a zero trust definition, uh, time check, how much time do I have left? Um, about nine, minutes. nine minutes, thanks. So uh, one of the things that we want to do is we want to consider what do we actually want to model as part of our policies, as part of our identities. And at the root of it all is trust. Uh, I know we call it zero trust, but that's actually what we want is to establish what can I trust, what should I trust? And if we can model trust, then we, we are able to describe the relationships and how much we want to trust it. How much suspicion do I have of a given system? Does that suspicion, uh, is that over my threshold or under my threshold that I'm willing to, to trust it? And if we maintain these models of trust the, over time, that also gives us the ability to sunset the things that would no longer meet our, our trust. So this concept of trust, even though we call it zero trust, it's actually about managing the, the trust that's there. And this, to, hit a, to hit zero trust in a, in a large organization as well, you have to also get cooperation. So you have to start working with your InfoSec teams, get transparency between, between the various engineers and people who are, who are there. And so the, I mentioned before at the start, that you have to get the software to be able to make use of the zero trust components, the, the applications that are there. And you want to establish a good relationship with, with InfoSec. And one of the ways that I found is effective is you always want to start with something that's small, something you can get a, a small win. I'm not saying it's an easy win, but it's a, but something that's tangible. So if you start with an application, you say, we're going to apply zero trust controls to an application. This is something that you talk to your InfoSec people about. They're, they're going to be interested in it because they know that this is where the world is heading. And this actually gives them something small that limits the risk and gives you the ability to experiment. And... Uh, you want to focus, on, in the beginning, you want to focus on intra-service communication as opposed to inter-service. You want to say, how do the, in, the individual components internally communicate with each other? And that prevents you from affecting the outside environment in the beginning. In the long run, you want to actually control inter-service. That's where your high value is. But in your initial version, when you're doing that first application, you want it to be something that is smaller in scope, smaller in size, reduce the risk, make it, makes it palatable, and also allows the system to pivot if for some reason the security model doesn't work out. And one of the things you want to do as well is you want to regularly share your findings with your InfoSec team. Engage them in from the start. Tell them what you're going to do. Get feedback from them. It, it, treat them as a partner. Like they're they're not a brick wall. They they are partners in us getting to where we want to go, hitting our hit, hitting our requirements. And as you start to develop that trust, you actually find that the conversations will will shift. And I'll give you an example. Um, previous uh, organization that I did some work with, they uh, I had a group of engineers who vented for quite a significant period of time about uh, infosec, saying, oh, you know, they're doing all these terrible things, all this red tape that's going on. And after about 20 minutes, I stopped them and I said, have you considered their side of the, uh, the, have you considered InfoSec's point of view on this? Because you're talking about the red tape you're running into, they're living and breathing it. So any advice you can give them or any information you can give them, maybe there's a process change that, you could, that would help you understand what they need in order to help you succeed. You help, help, help them help you. Don't just sit there and complain about it. And in fact, uh, in some scenarios, they may even say, hey, we don't even have these controls. It might be something that you can build easily, that you can, that you can work through CNCF or some other similar group, and get those controls built and automate those particular portions and uh, end up in a better place. So the next time you run into these scenarios, you actually end up with an accelerated path as opposed to 
getting stopped and having to do this back and forth and missing your deadlines because the collaboration was too late. Um, and once you've done that and you have that first application, you get that early win, then show how that intra service uh, path ends up working in inter service over time as well. How you can, if you're careful on how you demonstrate your interest service communications, you can then show how these could then be applied at the broad, in the broader sense as you add more controls in a, in a careful way. And the other thing as well, remember we were talking about policy and standards. Once you have this in place, you actually have something tangible that you can point towards policy and standards because if there's not a policy, if there's not a standard, we can't have thousands of little exceptions everywhere. You have to actually get it into the policy. You have to get it to be, to be part of the standard. So you could say policy, we're going to use zero trust workload identities. Standard, we're using Spiffy. You know, for the procedure, here's how you install Spire. And so by helping set these things up and actually collaborating with InfoSec with them, you actually become a, a, a collaborator with them and you end up helping them de-risk the things that you want to see there and you actually get the things that you want in there while at the same time helping maintain that, uh, maintain that security. Um, make sure you also engage with the community as well. So there's a lot of really great resources. We have CNCF security tag. We have the Kubernetes SIG security group. And all of, these, all of these groups have people who are very interested in seeing you succeed in this particular space. And so, and people from different walks of life, some from vendors, some from end users. So engage with the community, they're, they're here to help. They're here to, to help also set poli like guidelines that people can follow as well. So there's a lot of different areas that you can actually help collaborate with and find what those best practices are across a wide group. And then those feed back into your, into your uh, organizations. So it ends up becoming this feedback loop where you get a wide variety of, of people and a lot of eyes on, on things that uh, we end up with something that's way better than just a small team in a company by itself looking at. So definitely get involved, bring, bring your colleagues, bring, bring your friends, you'll, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, and, f and finally, make sure to help your peers learn, uh, because these type of things, it's, it's, not, it's not something that we can do by ourselves. We, you know, we, we need to make sure that we de-risk it by making sure we have a lot of people who know, understand and can work with it. They can also help us find where the holes are. And at the end of the, at the, end of the day, we all want to practice, very important, we want to practice self-care. We don't want to burn out. We don't want to end up in a, in a bad place physically and mentally. And the only way we do that is by helping our peers, helping our colleagues learn and helping them sit and help set up the system in such a way that we can, that we can step away for, for periods of time. Um, so if you notice the theme, effective communication and collaboration is key. So keep this in mind. If there's nothing else you take out of this, uh, keep, keep this thought in mind. Um, and finally, this little term that I like, uh, separeade. I probably butchered the uh, the way you say it, but it's like dare to know. So don't stop learning. Don't take ownership. Go ahead and uh, spend the time to to learn. Not necessarily saying work harder, but work smarter. Work with your friends. Collaborate with people. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Frederick. Awesome stuff, man.